Welcome to Show Studio. It's our second men's roundup panel um, of the day, and we're going to be talking about the Milan shows, or lack thereof, because there was not that well, there was, God, grammar. There wasn't that many shows in there Milan. This, there weren't that many. I don't yeah. know what happened there. Family <laughs> back in the end. <laughs> Um, it's, well, it's an interesting season um, for men's because so much is changing in terms of how people are showing and I think the, the real effect of that was really quite strongly felt in Milan because there were some big hitters missing, um, Gucci being sort of the most obvious one. And I know Charlie you've written, you've written some pieces in the FT about this idea of men's and women's being shown together so I'm sure we'll sort of dive into that as well as looking more generally about the shows that did take place in Milan. Um, but before we kick off our discussions, and given that I've lost the ability to speak, I'll hand over to my panellists to introduce themselves, starting with you, Dino. Uh, hi, I'm Dino Bonacic, and I'm the online editor at Because London. I'm Charlie Porter, I'm a men's fashion critic at the Financial Times. I'm Carlo Brandelli, I'm a designer. Good glasses game on this panel, by the way. Mm. Good, good work, guys. <laughs> Dino's winning. Oh, oh that's not nice. So <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm I know both of you have amazing tasting. <laughs> we, we'll talk about it half an hour later. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so yeah, I want to go to the to the point that I made, which is this felt like a, a slightly odd season in some way in Milan because the Milan schedule can feel quite um, repetitive. When you're there, you know exactly what you're going to see at what time of each day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But obviously, this season there was these there was these strange sort of gaps in the schedule, um, largely because uh, Bottega and Gucci are sort of flipping around how they're showing. Charlie, what's your take on men's and women's together? I mean, men's and women's together, it, it, it's it, it depends on what works for the individual brand. Mm -hmm. Is the overriding thing so I, I, you can't really say anything more than that about it like if it works for a brand to show their men's women's together then they should show it together I mean I think the Gucci show which takes place next week mm -hmm. um, is a really interesting example because um, they have been showing men's women's together now for a while um, with men's and women's shows men women's in the men's shows and in the pre collections and all that and it does work as a unified whole um, the there can be times, and actually it's not, it, it's not the case in Milan, there weren't any examples of it, but there were in Paris, in Paris but, yeah. but there were a, a couple of examples of shows where brands showed men's and women's together and it really didn't work because the, the, the collections have such different temperatures and when you put men's wear with women's wear and women's wear is very ostentatious and men's is very reserved, then it immediately makes the design um, ambition of the men's go into the background slightly, sure. a bit like on an Oscar red carpet where the man goes into the background and the, mm. and the, and the dress goes front mm. forward and, and, and not just in terms of the nature of the garments but also in terms of the way that the designers seem to push themselves and they seem to push themselves more for the show of women's and like take spend less time caring about the little details that make men's wear so interesting. Mm. Um, but that's so completely relevant to this, this conversation. Yeah. But it been interesting, actually, the other interesting thing about this as well, though, is actually in New York, it's really interesting to see how much menswear is a big influence on women's wear in general anyway. Yeah. And some things we'll be talking about about these men's shows have actually followed through as trends into women's wear. So I actually think there's a kind of a, a bit more of a unified design idea happening. It's interesting that you say this idea of what works for every individual brand, because I guess one of the things that I want to sort of push on and establish is, are we going to get to a point where this becomes the norm? So actually, it doesn't really matter what matters for the individual brands. Everyone is going to need to sort of work with that system because we're going to see an end to the sort of January, June men's, the February, September women's. Is it going to be a case where brands are sort of increasingly pushed to show together? I think there's also still a lot of brands that are just menswear and people are kind of forgetting about that I think there is this the big brands that have both women's and men's mm. lines yes it's kind of makes sense especially for Gucci but then other brands that don't I don't I don't see for example Louis Vuitton ever showing men's and women's together well they have separate designs yeah exactly them, that's yeah. the thing so I think that's you know there's that's the case and then or, then also there's always kind of sometimes with men's shows which was in London as well you got like a few women's women's looks that look were kind of like a novelty rather mm -hmm. than they didn't feel as being like oh like we do women's wear they just felt like oh let's do something for the girls to mm. kind of to show it but I think in terms of Milan I think even yeah, like I think D squared was the f it was the first time that sh they showed both women's and men's mm. fully mm. this time, um, and Prada obviously does it and has been doing it for a long but time. But Prada is an interesting example because it's kind of what 
the former example of what Charlie was saying, which is brands that have shown together for a while, which is kind of what Gucci did before, but then still would have a men's show at the moment. But I think but Gucci's, Gucci's different from Prada in the fact that if you, I mean, I counted the pre-fall looks, the images they released, and there was the exact same number of men's as women's. Like to them, there's equality. Mm. Whereas with Prada, there's, yes, there's women's in the men's show, but when it gets to the Prada show in Milan next week, there's never new men's looks in the women's show. So there's no mm. equality in Prada. It just is they use the men's show as an example, as an excuse to show their pre-collection. Yeah, it's just a couple So it's a like bit Burberry, different. similar to what Burberry did before, no? I'm not sure, because I hadn't oh, been okay. to a Burberry. <laughs> can you show? No, but now it's, yeah, yeah, but, yeah but now before they're, they're it was, unified as a yeah. Yeah. But thing. before they did the same thing where it was kind of like during the men's, they showed a couple, couple of women's looks and then they repeated those men's looks at the women's yeah. shows later, so it's kind of... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what, what you say is, is completely correct about the fact that many of the houses have separate design teams or many of the houses don't want to design menswear or don't want to design women's wear. But there's another really, really so boring, banal, banal point, which is that there's a whole um, kind of a kind of town city of like people that travel around to these shows that aren't seen, which is the buyers. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty much impossible for the buyers of menswear to do their work at the same time as the buyers of women's wear. Like, so a store like Selfridges or a store like Bird Dog Goodman's in New York, they've got massive buying teams and the stores need to have, the brands need to have their time with those stores. Mm. I mean, the buying teams, and, and it, I, I think it would be a physical impossibility for, for men's and women's wear to be merged with the buying merge at the same time, this is so boring. But like, no, it's I think, not, it's but, but 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 it, but it's the, it's 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 why it's why fashion is such a kind of weird, slow moving ship in some ways because it's all this other admin and infrastructure that that goes on behind the scenes of all these shows that we talk about here. Then it's interesting that you mention the buyers because that's something that I always feel when at the shows is, and you you talk to them as kind of like this secret team of people, and I think that's a really good way of putting it because you can spend your whole fashion week with buyers around you without really ever seeing them at the shows because they're at the showrooms and they're going to the appointments right. and and it kind of raises the point even more that these shows often become sort of advertising or marketing exercises vanity. where well, no i don't think it's vanity <laughs> because there is a purpose to them but it's more of a consumer facing purpose than it is no, an I, industry no I, I, I do think there is still the case that a show focuses the mind of the designers and, and pushes them to make make creative acts or do creative acts whereas if they were just designing a collection that then went off and came back and was in the, in the showroom it wouldn't have the same kind of sense of completion and, and, and being pushed to the limit um, but the thing with the buyers is they're all actually happy for there to be more shows than, than ever because they are now in a situation where their online customer and, and their in-store customer as well wants more more often so mm -hmm. The buyers actually don't really care if they're buying during men's wear, women's wear, buying a capsule collection two months later, they don't care, they, they, they can flog it. So actually they're happy if there were more shows all year round. Mm. It's more a case for us journalists as to whether we want to yeah. spend our entire lives at fashion shows, which I don't. So no. that's why I don't do women's wear. And I it's also like, I, what I, do you cover as well? Because like I do men's and women's, but then there becomes that thing of all these big pre-shows and even, you know, covering those and writing about those, which were once a kind of hidden commercial collection. And it's like, the quantity of stuff that you're expected to, you feel even more like a sort of a publicist rather than a critic because it's just this endless amount of shows and new collections. I think the thing with pre-collections, they, they certainly assume that pre-collections get a nice review. I think that's, that's the weird, totally, yeah. weird, weird, weird re reality of pre-collections that they, that it's the catwalk shows, that the, the, the seasonal catwalk shows that are reviewed with a harsh eye and pre-collections for some reason are just described. Don't I mean, you, I, I, don't I, I, you think that's changing now? Because I think no, so many not. people... No. I mean, it actually isn't. I mean, like, things, I, I, I don't yeah. write about them because they don't exist in men's yeah. but if you look on, and, and they would, you know, if you look yeah, on... Yeah, but I think it's just that they're starting to do... That's the thing. I think what you were saying about, okay, Derek, when you're just showing something in a showroom, it doesn't push you or something, for, like, far enough. And that's what they're changing now, I think, in a way, because they're sh starting to show all the pre-collections and they're becoming oh, a spectacle. Yeah, there's, and it's well, there's, there's about to be the thing where everyone's a shooter and everyone yeah, shows. Yeah, couture. They're doing couture. But yeah. I mean the brands that show their pre-collections as well as a catwalk collection, yeah. they yeah. expect their pre-collections yeah. to be reviewed. Okay. Yeah, you you never well. read a review of a pre that's like, this was shit. <laughs> like, you, it's always just... Yeah, and it's always like the, co the, whole, the whole context of it. Oh, that's... They're doing, you know, like, pieces that are going to sell. But you review it in a different something. way, yeah. I guess, because as you say, it's seen as... It's not seen as a creative proposition. It's seen as something that's going to sell. But then the sweet irony of that is that 
pre it tends to be sort of the like the bulk of a shop's buy would be anyway this pre. is kind of irrelevant because we talk about menswear here in this panel and <laughs> there isn't pre collection men, in, in menswear but it's good know, to hear can... three journalists talking about well, it well, <laughs> what, well, no, what's because... your take you're staying unnaturally quiet are they? <laughs> thanks Luke <laughs> <laughs> just because you always tell me off I um, tell you off <laughs> how dare you I'm like your mum now I think what is interesting and um, there's a comment you said earlier Lou, you said that um, the brands you feel more like a publicist and I think the brands do see the media as publicists. <clears throat> I was just trying to think back of when I first saw my first show, and people don't know this about me, but I was a fashion consultant for some Japanese companies way back when I was trying to fund my first Project Squire. And I'd go to see a lot of shows, and it was very clear in those days, and I'm talking about 1998, sorry, 1988, 89, and then have block A would be buyers, and block B would be press, or block A would be press and block B would be buyers and all the buyers would be on one side and all the press would be on the other side and the days before celebrities used to come to fashion shows can you believe such a thing ever happened and it was very very clear buyers were there press were here and you'd see the shows and it was still obviously business driven by the bigger shows that you'd see and I saw I, saw, I would see Armani shows I worked for this company called Mitsui who owned Burberry and built Burberry over there and I designed for Burberry black label when it first started and Mitsui um, also co-owned the license for Versace and Jules Sander and Valentino, a lot. There were lots of brands. So you'd see a lot of shows and it was very, very clear who was doing what. And um, I was trying to think back as you were talking about, you know, dissecting those pre-collections and more collections and business driven. There, there really wasn't at that time a collection for the showroom and the buyers and a collection for the show because it was much clearer what everybody was doing. Whereas now, um, it's pretty defined. There is the show, which is mm. supposed to entertain, right? You still look for entertainment, I guess, as critics mm. from a show, or not? Well, don't a lot of critics get very holier You than don't look for entertainment. It depends. Yeah. yeah. Some people get quite brands. holier than now, and are like, I just look at the clothes. Yeah, but then you go to see Tommy show. Yeah, you're actually quite good for that. But a lot of people <laughs> that say that, and then they'll write loads about like how fabulous the music was or something. Yeah, well, that's okay. I think it's very blistered yeah. now, isn't it? You go to see the whole thing. And the last 10 years, I've seen designers present a very holistic view of design, the collection, their interiors. It's all in the presentation of the show. And this last year, as a designer for menswear, I think it's been fantastic. It's been like an explosion that I saw in the 70s as a young child. So much different colors, so many different ideas. People have gone absolutely everywhere. They've referenced a lot of art, architecture, everything is in there, popular culture. So super exciting. But with that excitement, well, actually, you know, we were talking about, I was watching other panels, why, why has that change come so dramatically in the last two years? Is it because culture has changed so dramatically? So all the what, designers... What, the focus on menswear? Yeah. I think it's partly the, sort of the new icons of today. So I wouldn't want to chalk it all down to celebrity, but if you look at the way that men who have a huge amount of influence dress, it tends to be more experimental. I think it is slightly that for no, you. The, the reason is that the, the basic reason for the big change in menswear is, is the fact that there are more men who who no longer have to be in a suit from oh, Monday to Friday. Work, yeah. mm. And so it used to be from Monday to Friday that you were in a suit. So fr Saturday, Sunday, you had to really, really care about your look to dress mm. up or you yeah. just dress or terribly. Or yeah. Dress up. And, and so there are still obviously now millions and millions of men who still have to wear a suit Monday to Friday, but all their friends who don't, they now have a level which makes them tr 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 change their game. And, and meanwhile, there are all these men who work from internet cafes or work with a laptop or work hot desk or whatever mm -hmm. and have done for their entire working life who now dress up not necessarily dress up but they'll go to APC to buy their clothes or they'll, they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll they're, they're, they're more, they care more they care more so the big the big change mm -hmm. in clothing has been completely societal and but I think that societal thing does come back to to the acceptability of being interested in fashion and that's kind yeah. of what I mean by mentioning the celebrity thing I think if you're a young kid I think and you're like what 16 or 17 20 years ago, if you turned around to your mates and started talking to them about clothes, you would have seemed pretty fucking weird. Whereas now, like, if you look at, I don't know, people like ASAP Rocky and people like that, it's kind that. of cool to be interested in fashion. And it's kind of masculine in this weird, I, I don't mean no, that. It always was, though, in but like even the terraces fashion. I mean, it's always, it's, it's always been there. What fashion? Terraces. 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 Yeah. Casuals. Casuals, yeah. yeah. It's, always, it's always yeah. been there. It just is that there's now more the ability for men to to actually have the have the energy to do it 
Mm. Because because they're not exa- they, they they have more time to do it. But or I think Paris Koch was so niche. That was like a select group of people who like it was like collecting. No, but, it was kind of the same as buying vintage cars. Yeah, know, but it's like kind of a bit. Yeah, but the thing is, like the, the the thing about casuals was that it was a straight male yeah. culture obsessed with yeah. clothing. So therefore, the thing of like being acceptable to because obviously within gay culture, there's been an understanding of fashion for a long for, for yeah. a long for a long while. And so I think if you're going to say that it being acceptable for 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 young men to say they're interested in fashion, that's always been there in some way. It just yeah. is that it's the more... Pe- that peacock yeah. value. Sorry, Dino. No, no. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I just go, wanted go. to mention like a really like simple idea of like football players and being kind of those like super mainstream, mm. super uh, hyper masculine kind of guys, which are now, you know, front row in fashion shows yeah. and all that. So I do kind of, yes, it may be like something that's always been apparent, but I think now more so than ever before is now that like it's kind of okay to buy a pink shirt to that like super simplistic level yeah. but it is like you know like a printed pair of trousers you can buy an h and m which you yeah. couldn't 10 years ago it's so to that like crinkle down yeah exactly yeah. i think it's been normalized and just generally like, not by i'm sorry i just find it such a kind of um because there's so much celebrity use of celebrities explanation in fashion which i think is so um it's an easy, easy, yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah. And, and and like as soon as it's mentioned, like I'm to switch off. But I, I think, I I think there's, there's so the much more about. I, I think the way, but the, I think the overarching themes of dressing aren't aren't to do with celebrity. But I don't. I think if you talk to, yeah, I think you're right. But I think if you look at a retailer like a real core high street retailer, like a or an online retailer like a Top Man or an ASOS, and you looked at what was driving their sales of certain pieces. It would be people like Kanye West and ASAP Rocky. Definitely, like what guys have seen on their Instagram, what they're wearing, what seems normal. I'm not saying that's the same as it pushing trends forward or moving the course of menswear, but I definitely think it has a huge impact on what men feel comfortable wearing. Is this the longest we've ever talked without actually talking about catwalk shows and catwalk wearing? <laughs> yeah, but this is all important, important <laughs> music <laughs> context. That, the, pe- the peacock, that kind of man wanting to dress up, was there in all those youth cults when they were established. So yeah. it was there in punk, it was there in mod, it was there in casual, it was there in goth. You know, th- those people wanted to stand out. And I-, I went through all those youth cults, as I suspect Charlie may have gone through a couple. You go through them dressing up <laughs> and you understand. <laughs> yes, no, I don't think I did actually. Oh, okay, good, good for you. Yeah. What did you used to wear when you were small? Um, well, I was kind of late 80s for being um, starting to wear clothing, so I was um, buying things from Sign of the Times in Kensington Market. So it was kind of rave related in a way, but I kind of cobbled together. But you never considered yourself like part of a subculture? No. That's interesting. Are there subcultures now? Dean, who's the youngest, <laughs> Dino and Lou? Because um, I could have, when I was in my like early teens, yeah. I could have named them all quite um, easily. I think the last true subculture was emo. No, but the thing is, is the, but the yeah, thing I is, I was too young for that, it. even then. You said but that with the affection. How old are you? 23. Oh my gosh. Oh. Um, but I think you're talking about these peacocks, but then like if you look at the shows at, in Milan in generally, there were like a lack of them in a way. Oh my God, no, I think them. peacocking is back enormously. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. Are there any subcultures now, Dean? No. Sorry, um, no, on, no, I don't. I don't. I mean, I, Give us a I never felt. Look, I never felt us being part of a subculture, and I think um, the whole idea of a subculture is something that's been so, you know, because I think what what makes a subculture is, are the limits of it. Like yeah. there's like a limit to it. Now there's no limits to being anything, so you can so literally can be become developed. anything. Any. No, that's not true. You mustn't say nothing can develop. The basic the basic difference is is that. Um, Subcultures used to be methods of communication and, and sending message about yourself and what you believe and what you thought. But now that young people can message, can send messages about themselves. Literally, mm. they don't need to send the same messages as subcultures. So, yeah. so the, the, the confine there, there isn't the same yeah. need for the, the subcultures to exist. So, you so said this the other day. It's exactly that. It's like you used to wear clothes to say something about yourself. Now you can literally send a tweet. So the or you can send a direct message, or you yeah. can make you can make stuff happen. So that, that that's why. Hold I, on, I, hold on. I have thoughts. <coughs> it's rare. Um, when I was when I was playing in a band when I was that age, you know, 16, 17. What did you play? Bass, obviously. No, bass. Um, <laughs> guitar. Come on. <laughs> Lucky you didn't say I was a drummer there, Lou. Um, we were dressing as the musicians were dressing. There weren't mm. stylists, and there weren't people from the street that bands were copying. 
the bands were being copied by the people and the fans, and that's a fundamental shift in the last 20 years. No, but the thing, no, be, no, because the thing is, most bands now are people wearing jeans and a t-shirt behind a keyboard or computer. Okay. So and what does that say? It's what amazing. Because the things, the, the most radical thing you can do, I, I love it when children of punks dress boringly because it upsets punks so much that yeah. their children aren't dressing like they were. And the thing is, that's the most radical thing they can that's do punk. is is upset yeah, yeah. the parents. Yeah, so actually, yeah. actually, I yeah. think the, 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 the I think there is radicalism in dressing in the most boring way when you're when you're young. Mm, that's certainly coming through in a couple of designers, but not from Milan. No. Should we have a look at Let's the talk. show? Can I get more tea? Is that what? <laughs> Of course you can. <laughs> more tea for Charlie P. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's look at the shows. What what was the stand? What show should we've got Prada up? Can on we screen? start with Prada? You don't want to start with Prada. No, let's start with Prada. Let's start with Prada. Prada. Charlie, tell us about the Prada show. So the Prada show um, was uh, at the season. The, the current season, um, the spring summer season, wasn't that great. Um, so sort of the season before this. So it kind of needed to be a good. Why did um, you say it wasn't that great? Um, it, to me, it seemed like a thanks. Get milk, or sugar. <laughs> that the <laughs> one. Yeah, it was the, it was the rucksacks the and, rucksacks. The, and the and the and, and the hiking, and it, it was a lot of styling and a lot of kind of jum, jumble of stuff that then disappears when you take it apart. Can we get that one up that Charlie's talking about the season before of Prada? Sorry to be tedious, but like, but 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 it didn't have it didn't have an emotional connection particularly, and. and the nicest things in it were actually the, was actually the quieter things, which were plays of different sizes of checks and colour and suiting mm. that you couldn't really see. And, and um, <clears throat> there we go. Yeah, yeah, that one. And and also the thing for me, one of the as soon as anyone does um, technical outerwear, the thing for me is like just go snow and rock or just go yeah. millets. Like <laughs> go down millets. Well, no, but you know, but really, like you know, it's, it, it, there, there has to be a reason to to buy a Prada version of of of. of Pizza or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and, and so for me, I, I was really um, hoping. Thank you very much. I was really hoping that this Prada show would would have some connection, some soul. And the great thing that Mrs. Prada does when she's really working is is do something that's so kind of convincing and and um, and oh, it's authentic. And and and, and actually, the, the thing with this as well is that it felt really clever. Like the people wearing the clothes look clever, which seems like a really weird thing to say. But like, there's a there there, there was a kind of bookishness about them, and, and luxury fashion can have such a kind of is vacuity a word? Vacuous, 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 something. Anyway, that's probably that shows me for saying that <laughs> saying that word, not knowing what that word is. But like, but but, but there was Empty. a. There was a, there was there was a real connection with this, and also it was it just was super 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 desirable, and I wanted to wear loads of it. You didn't like it? No, no. <laughs> I mean, I did. Like, I actually did like it as well, like more than the last one. But for me, it just didn't. I mean, maybe because I wasn't. You were obviously there, so probably you got the experience of it. But for got me, the sexy through, bed. yeah, the like um, <laughs> through the through the whole, um, it just didn't. I mean, it didn't look desirable, like, and it, it didn't look that look in particular is so desirable. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I completely can acknowledge that, that may look in real life, but in photos, I you have to say that it doesn't. Oh, to me, it doesn't. doesn't really it does jump out. Yeah, yeah. Really well, does. maybe. It's, I mean, the, it's not my the, the, the like if you scroll back to the, the beginning, the one. The first few looks were like I think the women they're like super seventies. I really did like them. Like the girl, like naturally Weston. So the, the, this this guy here, that the first, the first um, zip up kind of Harrington and corduroy. I mean, actually, the first guy, like just to, to send out, the, basically, if the first look looks like a proud member of staff i'm happy <laughs> like i it, I, all, it, it was a, a this season has been one where normality it, it, it kind of rules and if the guy looks normal it's great actually and then this guy here in this in the sweater with the beard um, but then it's this weird heightened look. form of normality isn't it where when you actually look at it it's so Not. it's peacocking though in the way that carlo said is it's like it's this is a really eclectic um more is more collection in some ways. Like it's easy to say it's boring, but actually, I didn't say it was boring. No, I, mean, I, I don't mean you think it's boring, but I mean like playing on that notion of boring. No, I, I don't think it's playing on the board of boring. No, I didn't say that. It's normality and boring are different things. Like I think mm. it's the, it's the opening with a sweater is a really normal yeah. thing to do. Um, no, it's it's not it's not boring. It's not aiming for boringness at all. I mean, it, it is aiming for um, a, a looseness yeah. of of, th of that decade. Um, and the kind of 
attitude that comes with that. I guess what I find interesting, and I couldn't quite reconcile for, for myself this season, is the interplay between exactly what you're saying, which is this interest in sort of normality and the everyday and familiarity, but then also this flip side where you saw designers kind of trying to do something that felt sort of political and urgent and in some ways slightly sort of irreverent. And I couldn't quite square those two. Well, the, 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 draw, the dividing line is whether it's a fashion brand or a luxury brand. That's the clear dividing line. If it's, a, if it's a fashion brand, then they have an ability to say a more political message because they, they are part of a conglomerate that has shareholders all around the world and has difficulty saying a political message. Whereas if you're a luxury brand, by the very nature, they can't be overtly political. Mm -hmm. um, and also by the nature of luxury. Luxury is a passive, yeah. passive, passive form of fashion. It's not, you know, it's not fashion, it's very different. So politics and luxury. But do you really think you can still separate luxury and fashion? Oh my God, they've never, they've never been the same thing. They're always separate. But I don't they, think they, they, they are they, No, of course they are. But then what are. would you call Kim Jones, Louis Vuitton? What would you call Craig Green? What would you call Rick Owens? What would you That's call? That's fashion, but what would you, exactly. call, but what would you call Kim Jones, Louis Fashion Vuitton? and luxury can overlap. They're okay. Venn diagrams, they can overlap. <laughs> and they, at, at times in the last, in this century, it's been like they've been the same thing. Yeah. But they <clears> always are separate, always. They're definitely not the same thing. Fashion and luxury overlap and quite often are very much covering each other like this. But you cannot say that fashion and luxury are the same thing. I wouldn't thing. say they're constantly so, the, only thing, but the same thing, but I wonder, I don't know if a consumer, I, I don't know, I think it's, I think it's really well, hard when you look at something like Hyde Ackerman and what he's doing, if you look at something like, yeah, Kim at Vuitton. Please. No, but therefore, because it, the two can coexist, of course they can coexist. So That's where don't they brands, coexist? By the, by the, by the, by the, the politics is just a, luxury then. No, because the two, fashion, no, because the two can coexist. That's what I'm saying. Then diagram. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I know, I get it. The two can coexist. But like, but, but basically, the, the basic point is, politics is a really clear example. Yeah. Politics, if you're a fashion brand, you can make an overt political statement because you're fashion. And fashion is reactive and about pace and it doesn't care about. But do you think a consumer differentiates between buying fashion or buying luxury. Do you know what? I think most people don't don't understand that there's a difference, and a lot of designers make the fatal mistake of not realizing there's a difference, and that's why their shows are so bad. Whereas actually, luxury brands should be going for luxury first with some fashion in it, and fashion brands should be doing fashion and not pretending to be luxury. So who gets that right? Um, I think Prada get it right. I think Kim gets it really right, and the people I just said. I think Rick gets it really right by being fashion. He yeah. Rick would never say he was luxury. Yeah. I suppose we, like I was talking with Craig Green about this very thing. He he calls himself fashion. Yeah. It's and actually I'm really excited that student like the the students at Westminster, the BA students, they're really clearly this year's crop. They're really clearly doing fashion. The worst thing is when you see a student, a graduate collection, and it's got fur in it, and it's attempting to do cocktail, and it's like you can't do that. You're not a luxury brand. You've not mm. like you should be, you should be doing fashion. You're a fashion student. Mm. Do, you, do you know what I mean? Like, no, I do. Like, people can change the idea of luxury, <coughs> and then you're kind of limiting them. I mean, no, I'm not limiting anyone. They like can be both. But like the thing yeah. is, is that you have to. I'm just saying the two absolutely are separate. Yeah, no, but I mean, I think I've seen that like, you're talking about like the, the, the idea of a student doing fur and stuff. There's like, I've seen a preview of the new London College of Fashion um, collections and there's a guy in there, an Italian guy. Um, I think his name is Lorenzo Bussi, or I'm not sure. Um, you just picked really, a really Italian no, name. No, I, really I think his think. name is Lorenzo Pasta. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, pizza. Pizza pasta. No, um, no, Steady and people. his name is, uh, yeah, Lorenzo. And, um, his stuff is that kind of take on luxury, and he's doing like mink shoes and stuff like that. Good for um, him. I mean, I hate fur, so no, good thing. No, I don't. I'm just saying but the idea of like I think the idea of somebody like that being able to um, <coughs> kind of challenge the idea of luxury and take that. Sure. Okay. Maybe good thing. What, yeah. what I mean, there was a time about ten years ago when mm. students. When 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 all all everyone was talking about was luxury fashion, yeah. and students all felt like they had to be in their yeah. collection to be doing a version of luxury, yeah. whereas now they're doing fashion. fashion. Do you think that's part of the reason that, that, that there's that crop of London designers, so your Jonathan Saunders and people like that, who never quite managed to sort of make their yeah. businesses work? Do you think it was because they were trying to do luxury yeah. and they should have been? That's interesting. But what? then he's got a great, he's now at DVF and he's doing No, I'm not, yeah. no, 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 he's amazing. No, 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 but his brand closed in Britain. And there's a whole generation of people who fell because they were forced to make cocktail dresses. Women's wear. But it's women's wear again. We're, we're yeah. Sure. What's your take on the Prada show and also the fashion versus luxury debate? Um, has raged <laughs> forever and here. No, no, it's interesting. To, I mean, I've known Charlie a long time. <laughs> <laughs> he always interviews me really well. Always very complimentary up until now. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be careful. 
Well, no, genuinely, you are. You, you always. You said it earlier, Charlie. You kind of you comment to what's in front of you. You yeah. don't really get involved in the noise. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think Rick, and you know, I, I I know some of the people there that are involved with it. The nature, because it's very expensive, and the materials they work in, especially the leather and the t-shirts, it's ex it's expensive, and that in, is in a way luxurious. Yeah, but Rick will very clearly call it fashion rather than luxury. Something can be luxurious and be fashion. Yeah. I do I agree think, with that. Like yeah, something I think can be made um, beautifully and still be a fashion. Yeah, product. well, time, time and craft. This is why you know I I like craft in my work. Craft is something which to me is luxurious because not many people can do it, and it requires mm -hmm. a certain discipline, skill, time, um, to actually master and develop, <clears throat> and it's worth doing these things. Whereas the idea of something being luxurious, I mean, I've said it before, for me, luxury is time and silence. These are the luxuries in my life. It's got nothing to do with how much anything costs. It's just being silent in this noisy world, and I mean mm. physically noisy, and the, the amount of visuals you're bombarded with every day, and having the silence to think about things properly and connect with the work that you're doing. Mm. So although I, I agree with what, all, with, with what Charlie said and Dina and what, with, what you're saying as well, luxury and fashion and together, I can remember a time when luxury wasn't even a word mm. being used around fashion. You know, there were fashion brands and then there were these other brands that were, um, what were they? Actually, what were they brands They were bourgeois, like? weren't they? I mean, they were, they were bourgeois. Yeah, possibly. Well, even further back, they were just known as couturiers. I mean, Chanel, Balenciaga, Schiaparelli. Yeah. They were just craftspeople and they were elevated to the level of fashion because of the work and the artistic mm. nature of their work. But going into the 70s and 80s, and especially with Armani, who we're probably going to review, mm -hmm. are we? And Armani kind of started to talk about this idea of ready, wear, ready to wear. You know, he trained with Chiruti, you know, Nina mm. Chiruti. A lot of those ideas that Armani has. Is this Armani on the screen now, guys? This is Emporio, uh, Giorgio. Emporio. That's to Emporio. Yeah. And I think Armani started to, with his style, use expense, more expensive fabrics for ready to wear. And I think that started to become luxurious. As a designer, you equate luxury to either time and craft and something artisanal mm. or the value of the cloth on the but price of the cloth. Would we, how would we place like a technology brand and all this? Because it's interesting if you look yeah. at like gifting markets especially in places like Asia, like Apple has overtaken things like Louis Vuitton and what have you. Mm. Is that because people are now seeing technology products as luxury? Because they're de definitely not seeing them as something related to style no, or fashion. No, they're not seeing it as luxury because they're happy to take it away in a plastic bag. Like, yeah. that's the, like, no, but they're, Apple's they're, they're now like a gifting. Like a oh yeah, but that's been the greatest thing about Apple is it, it's not cared about, it doesn't elevate it in a way yeah. that it ma ma makes it approachable. So you, you yeah. feel happy to spend a thousand pounds and take it away in a plastic bag. I mean, but you're thinking yeah. of luxury in a very kind of, not kind of, but in a very traditional way of like luxury means being, you know, being treated with a glass of champagne and um, having like a bag with like a bunch of paper inside and then opening yeah. it and then tying it with a silk ribbon. I mean, that is luxury, but that's a very kind of specific type of luxury. People today, like, I mean, they don't care about what bag they get it in like they care about it getting in instantly that's a luxury today getting in like the mm. supreme you know like product that's released they want it now now and that's what their luxury is yeah so luxury I think, speed yeah exactly yeah. luxury speed luxury is like you know well, it's interesting to limited get... edition stuff as yeah. well they don't care about how it's going to be shown it, whether it's going it's the same like people queuing for an iphone i know? mention this all the time but it's interesting that speaking to some of the, the people in the couture studios who are saying that the younger clients who are buying the couture don't even want to come in and do the fittings mm. like they find that time consuming and annoying so for them they want this idea of luxury which is something bespoke to them but they don't equate yeah. that process of be, having something tailored to you to your body as being luxury can we talk about the shows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about can we just zip back to Prada really quickly because Carla I want to know what you think of the Prada show because quite you those kind of those tones yeah, the it's hair. very Italian. I mean, she's from parts of the world that I know well. And why Charlie said something that, you know, I, I picked up on and I, I also saw, there, there is a f much more of a feel of intelligence to what she does. And I think when you layer things with texture and particular color palettes, because these aren't, I would imagine that these aren't regular colors that they've just picked out of um, collections. You know, she used to have, she was famous for having an enormous color studio where they just design all the fabric as well as all the collections as well. I don't know if she still does that, do you know? I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah, she had an enormous studio. I nearly worked for them once. <coughs> and um, there were 
it was just colors of fabric. They designed every single fabric and it, they chose every single color. And the colors here are very, very specific. Some of those rusts and browns and uh, I thought deep they felt browns. like quite quintessentially Prada colors. Because I think she's associated herself to this sort of palette, yeah. which is very warming. Yeah, I but can't... awkward with it. Yeah, there's, well, there's edge, isn't there? Those yeah. sweaters are lovely. The sweaters there, they were, they were meant to be bad painting. Yeah. So they were taken, they were meant to be like paintings you see on the Seine on a Sunday. Yeah. And in they, a hotel they were room. so lovely. Yeah. I mean, those th the centre picture, the three colours, that yeah. kind of mauve, moving to grey, moving to like a light ochre to yellow, putting that colour palette together is actually, it's quite a delicate thing, even if they are referencing those paintings on yeah. the scene that we've all seen. You know, putting those yarns together, and it's quite textured, is that mohair? Is that a mohair so, and alpaca? Yeah. Mm, yeah. I can't remember. It has, some, it has a kind of, it has a real movement to it. Making those colours work together, make them delicate, because they look very, very delicate as well. But there is something quite learned about the palette. So I, I learned really is like, quite a good word, yeah. word for this collection, because the mixture of the colours and the textures and the fabric, it feels crafty. You know, there's got that mm. sense of touch by hand and blah, blah, blah. I thought these women's looks were awful. And I thought it was the time when the show kind of went off. And this was actually a, a time when, um, when men's and women's didn't work together, the rest of the looks worked so well together. Mm. Well, this part, it was, it was actually the, the, the look before, but yeah. with the kind of floral on it. And, it, and yeah. suddenly the women's. And one, one, one with, the, with, uh, with floral. Well, I can't remember. But like it was, it, 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 it was, it was a. Um, one, yeah, that one. Yeah. These, that one in there, the middle, Charlie. especially. Yeah. Mm. yeah and and the it was. Purple. And it, uh, the, yeah. the one in the middle. Yeah. It was oh, a real yeah. case where, where the women suddenly goes off somewhere else and the men's doesn't follow. and that suddenly it's like, oh, women's has to be decorative suddenly. And it's like, oh, how does men's respond to that? Oh, it doesn't respond. Oh, okay, we sit there like this and not respond to that. Well. It's interesting about the flow of the show and what you were talking about earlier, men's where, you know, men's um, having debating whether to show with women, women debating whether to show with men and the flow of the show and how it, how it went. Obviously, those are three women's looks that they had to just put into a menswear show to show them but they understand that afterwards forever it will be the still image that will be captured with no sound no I mean, context, that's, I mean, no dialogue. I, I'm, I'm, I'm often very aware of the fact how, how lucky I am to have lived through this era of fashion shows mm. they will at some point change and disappear and there is this weird art well I mean they just will at some point I mean fashion shows haven't existed for that long yeah. and when they first came about they were you know they, they, they only I mean I'm not an expert on it at all but like they've only become in this format in the last one for 30 years. 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and but the first men's way show was Sala Bianca and it was yeah. by Brioni. There's a really good book on this which you've read, Charlie's done a really good thing on his blog about Caroline Evans's yeah, The Mechanical Smile yeah. and people should get that book and read Charlie's piece in the book because it's brilliant about yeah. fashion shows. But, but the thing is is that like there's an assumption of the language of fashion that these things have always existed and will always exist and of course they won't but the thing is I'm lucky to have lived in an era where I've seen true masters of this art of and it's such a weird art because it's just putting clothes in a certain order mm. to create Thank an emotive you. effect and, 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 a, and, a, and a language through the way they're shown and, and, and it's been a real privilege to, to see shows like that. So that, that's, that's, what, that's, what I talk, that's what I mean when I talk about the order of it. Yeah, um, mm. there's cultural intelligence as well. We are now in a position in 2017 where we can look at how those textures, colours, feelings, moods, semiotics have all been put together and understand that it's kind of relevant for now. If you take that out completely out of context and put it in the 1980s for a designer, which I'll, I'll mention now, which I think's maybe been a bit forgotten about, when Jean Paul Gaultier kind of took over yeah. the fashion arena for such a long period. I don't know if you saw any of those shows, Charlie. Was I only saw you? later ones. Oh, okay. And you know, you remember how big Gaultier was? Mm. And the, um, well, he was the origin, original um, enfant terrible, wasn't he, before McQueen? Mm. And he would put a whole mass of things together from street culture different ideas, it all just was mm. thrown together, but it worked because there was a sentiment at the time that understood the context of which he was working. But I find it interesting mm -hmm. how much things, how things can look so timely. Like when, when I was, no, it was when I was in Paris, not in Milan, <coughs> I'm conscious to go back to the Milan shows shortly. Um, <laughs> but one of, my, um, one of my friends collects old magazines and he got French glamour from the 90s, which then Kareem Rockfeld was there and styling it. And some of the pages literally looked like they could be from to, today. Yeah, today. Like, totally, it was a lot of the stuff that was kind of minimal, undone, kind of that mm. Jamie Hawksworth Hollywood aesthetic. 
and then some of the stuff could not have looked more dated. And it's really, really weird to think about why and when certain things can be revived and why they can't. And I think that's particularly more interesting in men's than women's, because in women's, that's something kind of anything goes almost. But in menswear, which is, is more driven by codes and, and sort of certain things can look really bad in menswear. I think it'd be good easily. to keep talking about the shows. And the, the point about this show is that those young men look in those clothes today. And yeah, so exactly. backstage, backstage afterwards, they, they were hanging about in the clothes because I think they were being photographed and they were all on their phones and they looked like they could have been wearing, particularly the guy earlier in the, in the corduroy Harrington, he looked like he, he looked comfortable. Wearing, he looked like it was his. He looked but like that's really his. rare. So that, that's, that. yeah, especially because these are, these are mostly young men. And, mm. and, and um, so I think a, a relevancy to how they look today, I'm going to, I've run out of things to say. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the next show. Should we talk a little bit Marnie. about. <laughs> You want to Marnie. Say? Marnie. Do you want to talk about, about Marnie? Yeah, yeah really Marnie. Talk about Marnie. So change of foot at Marnie. Um, talk uh, to us about Marnie. Oh God, I'm obsessed with it. Um, no, I just I looked at it and it looked for me. I think what you just how you described Prada show for you. <laughs> that's how I felt about the Marnie show. Thank you. Um, it just felt kind of interesting and fresh in a way that it was like very similar because I I do love women's wear sometimes I think. Like recently, I do kind of start start appreciate menswear more and more. Mm. But I am a big fan of women's wear. This was kind of something that I, a type of excitement that I usually get around women's wear. Mm, this so. would kind of. So what is it that excites you more about the women's wear? Just because you I feel think it's it was more... just it's just it. Okay, I'm not talking about maybe the last couple of years, but before that, like as a child especially, it was like this whole like idea of fantasy. And with men's, it was not there wasn't that much of that idea of fantasy. I still occurring. don't think there's much idea no, of fantasy. No, no, exactly. In the it's I mean there are particular designers that. Do you? What? Do you think there's fantasy in the men's? Why should there be? Well, I think fantasy drives fashion in some ways. <laughs> Do you know? Let's talk about money. <laughs> no, but no, get excited. Yeah. I think that's hugely. Let's like, talk that's about money. <laughs> She, she wants. She wants. Give it to a child. She wants. It. I want to know. No, they're two very completely different things. Like, I mean, oh god, they're so like. like let's talk about money. <laughs> no, but if you're talking about, for example, you know, like designers. Who brought up the word fantasy? I did. Yeah. I did. But um, so you qualify what you mean by fantasy. No, but you fantasy mean as in something is. Yeah, exactly. It's like what Gucci does. That's fantasy for me. I mean. That's you may disagree with that, but that's for me. It's I fantasy. Think it is, yeah. it's like, I think it's also what it's Grace like a, does in a way. Yeah, like, Grace. And without sounding like I'm exoticizing the culture that she draws on, I think there is an element of fantasy yeah, to of what course. she does, yeah. and like Craig because it Green draws on does, spirituality. I mean, Craig Green's last collection that was like for me it was like pure kind of fantasy in a way. Mm. Yes, it's clothes and yes, it's fashion, but it was like kind of like in the joy that it brought me, and that's mm. what this collection for Marnie kind of had me. A bit. So Francisco, um, that was his first yeah. collection as, yeah. as uh, uh, Marnie, and he's come from Prada, so exactly. the link is really clear. I mean, like, and 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 I think there are. I, I think the the great thing about this was that he just felt so kind of happy to be there and, and free and but excited so and excited. At the same time. Well, excited to make yeah. the clothes and make this collection and and also make it a shambles. Like he wanted it to be a total shambles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it's all over the place. It's a mess. And it's brilliant and, yeah. mm. for that. Um, he it, and also the great thing is he. he, he I mean, I, I think I'd met him once before, but I don't know him particularly. But there were so many people from Prada backstage to, to kind of congratulate him. That's like nice. he's really he's yeah. really well liked. He's he. I think he I think there's a kind of real feeling. How long was he at Prada for? I don't. I'm not putting you on spot. I have no I've idea. Yeah, got no I have no idea. idea. But, but 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 he. But there there were a lot of really senior people at Prada yeah. from Prada who were there at the show to, to kind of cheer him on. So they're really happy for him. I I think the the Marnie story is a it's an interesting one because um, it's a, another case of um, a designer who founded the label, selling their label, and then leaving the yeah. label. Um, I don't know the actual circumstances of what happened, but in a weird, I, and normally it's something I'm very kind of sus suspicious about because I don't. You don't like people designing when they design. I don't like it when, when people design under the name of living designers. But then this is rule. kind of Marnie, yeah, which makes it easier. Yeah. I, I, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. But but this is different in the sense that it's a brand called Marnie, yeah. and it does feel different in a way. And actually, for me, what he's doing 
is actually more related to what Marnie used to be because mm. I've not been interested in Marnie for quite a while and suddenly this had a naivety and yeah. a joyfulness oh, and a I think Marnie and a, got oppressively intellectual for a while. No, it got oppressively bland. But I think it was under this guise of like, we're smart, this no. is clever. The lean kind of... No, I do th I think I, yeah, definitely I think with the women. It was, yeah. it's like, it was one of these I mean, brands the, where... I've not looked at the women for so long, but the yeah. men's was just bland. Yeah. And, and the thing with this is back to the, that kind of boxing, charmy, sexless, like the lack of sex is su super important with it. Like it, it's completely the clothing to not kind of a a accentuate or elevate yeah. or anything. Um, humor, I think it but it's got that good. childlike thing, yeah. which but I the, think but, is really But also important. the main thing is that he's obviously got a really good eye for color, pattern, print, texture, combination of stuff. And he really enjoys making clothes. And he obviously really enjoys that he, he knows the type of guy that will go into the store to buy this stuff. Mm. You a fan, Carlo? Yeah, I understand what they're um, what they're saying. I can see the. Fr I don't know. Um, I don't know the designer, and I hadn't seen his work before a prod. I didn't. Did he just do the? Collection? No, he was he was just in the design studio. The design so. studio. Yeah. But I understand as um, this idea of. Fr I can see the freedom in the collection, and this nonsense, which is very very deliberate. You know the way it's been put together. Some things are tucked in, some things aren't. There's some mm. geometric prints thrown together with something plain. It's almost very nondescript. I think if you didn't know anything about fashion, you put the collection together on the rail. It'd be very difficult for you to put that together yourself. Mm. I think it requires intelligence to get to this level of articulation through clothing. This is, this is kind of what I mean about that new peacocking thing that I was talking about, where it's not that traditional kind of bravado three-piece suit, look how sexy I am, like, you know, waistcoat mm. as penis extension type peacocking. It's more of a different kind of that, where it's, it's, it's about showing off and really enjoying using your clothing to enhance your sort of personality and in some ways your masculinity. Mm. But in a way that, as Charlie says, it's kind of sexless and it's naive. It's kind of that Gucci thing where it's about maximalism and, and you wanting to be the centre of attention, but kind of just for the clothes you're wearing, not yeah. for any of the... You know when someone wears a three-piece suit and like a pocket square and an umbrella, they want to be the centre of attention, but kind of for being like a man. Or well, for being, all the wrong yeah. reasons. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I think... I agree with you to a way because I, you know, I, I love dressing that way or seeing other people dress that way. But I think that is kind of the new, the new type of peacocking. Is mm -hmm. it also kind of has a message with within? You yeah. know, there it's not like oh, I just love and enjoy playing with clothes. Yes, in a way. But then again, like you want to kind of show off that you're relevant, that mm -hmm. you know what like a like a piece, an it piece or whatever yeah. it is or who's the cool brand now or stuff I think it's just because fashion has become more of like a conventional thing to converse about and everyone mm -hmm. you know people in general media like talks about who the well, new kind of pop creative, culture yeah exactly way, yeah. Who, who the creative director of Marnie is now and that wouldn't be the case you know who would why, why would anyone care who the creative mm -hmm. director of Marnie is no but I think that's no one really I mean no one really knows who the creative director of Marnie that's one of the clever things about it as well is they're not pushing him as I think no, just yeah. is mine. I mean, but you I think in, know, like, in general know. that thing of like you know Maybe like it's on the front page of yeah, the paper yeah, yeah. when exactly. a designer moves houses now which is yeah. Yeah. I think it, always, it always would have been if it was a really famous design I don't think that was but they were not well, famous when, well, when, well, when, well when Queen and Gary and everything went I mean 20 years ago it was yeah I guess when, so when you know yeah. when I yeah. when when was before my time always has done there's always been just a few of them now but it's always always just a few now do you think? Okay. I do think like, there's more of, big, of a spotlight on the toing and yeah, but in terms of like, if you were to ask like someone who doesn't have any interest in fashion, who do they know about? Do they, do they know who Ralph Simmons is? I'm sure that actually most would probably most not. Wouldn't. Know. Yeah. Anyway, but the thing about the thing about Marnie, <laughs> the great thing is, is also this was all about cut of clothing as well. These were, yeah. these were great cuts, so it was great design. So like, he's also got confidence with what he's doing with his. With his cuts. With the colours. Anyway. Should we segue on to Fendi, which I also thought was a kind of, had a nice spotlight this season. Maybe, perhaps because of some of the absent uh, shows on the schedule, it kind of put a focus on And Fendi had been doing interesting stuff and I think was kind of emerged as a bit of a star from this season. I don't know, do you agree with that? Actually, it's a, it's a bit of a shame that I'm here to talk about it because I actually preferred the couple of seasons before. For me, this was a, a, a little bit too much novelty in the use <laughs> of language. A lot of novelty, yeah. The thing, the, the thing with Fendi is that Fendi menswear has been irrelevant for most of the time I've been writing about menswear and they've not really known what to do with it. I think it's always been a kind of a business over there for them. And then something clicked a couple of years ago and, and a stylist from London called Julian Gagne went to work with them and they've started actually really making garments and they really sell garments suddenly and the business for department stores is crazy and they've, they've really got a 
cust a luxury customer who wants to buy fashionable luxury but do you garments not think with this, novelty. This is slightly a good example where the men's and the women's can communicate to each other in a really good way because I think part of the reason they've nailed that men's business was in part through nailing... Oh, I think the men's is better than the women's. I think it's better, but I think it, there is a no, symbiotic no, relationship. I think it's different. It def that, that novelty thing came through the... The women. novelty, sure, yeah. the novelty, but the actual garments themselves... It's no, still, God, it's, yeah. It's still, yeah. The thing with this is it's still bread and butter, trousers, yeah. jackets, tops. You can still buy it and wear it. Yeah, exactly. The women's not, is not like the, hot pants and crop tops yeah, with like... The, the woman the is fanciful. No, Charlie does this particular <laughs> gesture when he's talking about over the top. Do it? Well, it's like women. That's what women do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, a perfect, <laughs> that's a perfect explanation for fancy. Yeah, yeah. 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 the men's back. If you look at these looks. Charlie, I missed it both times. You got one more on call? He does it all the time. It's but <laughs> it's clear to me. But, but, like a to win. But, 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 the, but, but this menswear is stuff that we can go straight into stores. And, and obviously the bags is what And girls are going to buy it, for mm. sure. Like the bags and stuff. I think those are going to be... I love those like furry bags or like woolly bags. I just think I those pool like slides Fendi. with the Fendi on it. Actually, do you know what? From looking at it without being there, it actually looks a lot more normal than it was. So actually, maybe mm. it's kind of clever than... There were, yeah. there, were a lot, there were a lot of words all over the place. Maybe they were on the, the back of... The guys had like yeah. back of hat, heads. They had yeah. like, like... Yeah, it was... Well, they had the colour, like, you know. Yeah, I love these yeah. strip bags. <laughs> I think it's clever, <laughs> isn't it? But it's, it's that direct feed of stuff. You know, there's stuff there for a certain consumer. There's stuff there to That's sell the, on the shop the, floor. The, the, point, like, the point of it is, though, is it, it's, it's very specific, like, and almost localised. Like, they're not trying to make a brand which then influences all of fashion. No. They're, they've not got ambition for it to be... Gucci or Prada, in, 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 I'm, sure, I'm sure they'd love the business to be that big, mm -hmm. but they're, they're, they're very clever, it's almost like a drone strike, they're very clever at targeting a very particular... Odd reference. <laughs> well, but they're it's not really revolutionising anything. Yeah. Yeah, really, it's a really particular yeah. form of luxury clothing, making a brand, uh, elevating a brand and making that customer excited. And so, it, it's mm. a, that, that, when you say like it kind of fills a void, it kind of doesn't, it kind of doesn't, because it's not going to save... Milan, like it, it, you don't, you're still not going to go to Fendi for like. No, I more mean it like it's an, you know like when Burberry didn't show and it meant that there was more focus on different brands in London. Yeah. I kind of felt like it was a bit like that. I mean, there was, the, I, it, it, I think it was the only show I saw that day. On yeah, the so, yeah, exactly. But 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 in terms of it, in, it but it. But you just look a little longer when there's less on your mind from you, other things. I think. Yeah. Don't you think this collection, for example, I think it, it does feel you know kind of consumer driven and everything, but it can. For me, it's a bit like maybe a year or two outdated in a way. But the thing is, that's what I mean about Yeah, the, exactly. The, the they're no revolutionary, so, so that's exactly what I mean. Well, there's like, little things just, like those zipper. It, there's things that look know, familiar. Yeah, and also like the, the, the branding, the branding that's that kind of like in your face, on your cap, mm. kind of feels slightly, not like outdated as in like 20 years ago, like literally maybe like a couple of seasons mm. behind. But then again, that's who their customer is. But that's is, also so, just a yeah. thing now, like logos, are selling really well, so everyone's and going to do logos. This collection was, was a very a good um, example of what I was saying about political messaging and what you can do when you're a luxury brand. And in this, the messaging was about positivity. So that sweater before that said yeah. love, or there was a headband that said yes. And Here there is. were there were general optimistic, positive, forward statements without in any way ever saying anything political. But I think that's kind of the only thing you can do when you're selling you're clothes for that brand. much money, exactly. is for, to be if, like... Yeah, also, <laughs> like that much money, not knowing who it is that's buying it. Yeah, yeah. Or what their political beliefs are. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's also a slight kind of well, cow cowardice yeah. for commerce. Like, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's... Which is, which, is going to, which is going to be across all luxury fashion. This yeah. kind of falls into that category, I think, of what you were saying, where like kind of luxury and, and fashion kind of go away. I think this is way more luxury than it is fashion, yeah. mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Let's talk about the Dolce & Gabbana show, which I'm sure you all deeply enjoyed. I mean, I, this is actually, I'm, I'm, I'm banned from Dolce & Gabbana, so I haven't really got anything to say about it. Why did you get banned for saying I've, I've been, I mean, most critics are banned now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. But the thing is, that's their choice in a way to do their business. Like, they... They, their business is going great guns at the moment. They don't want critics there. And the point is about shows is they're private entities. They're not public events. We're invited in as critics and they've got every right not to invite us in. So if they want to run their business that way, then that's their I choice. thought it was interesting because this like was- It's an expensive show probably in the entire world. Yeah, it was, they basically got any kid with like a good social media following yeah. to walk in it. 
girlfriends, boyfriends. Girlfriends, boyfriends. Yeah, every, couples, yes. YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, everything. Yeah, I mean... I, but, you know, you were saying with Hindi, this feel, felt a couple of years old. Like, Jesus, this felt a couple of years old. It's like, oh, you, Instagram is a thing. To maybe to... Uh, no, 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 but maybe to you and to me. But yeah. I bet that the coverage that they got from these people who they flew over and paid mm, a lot of money to do this show I mean, this is, I mean, this is in a league of its own, you know, the same mm. as, as Gosha is, yeah. <laughs> in a way, this is like speaking to a very different type of person, but it's in a league of its own, I think. Mm. Carlo, do you like Dolce? I'm, I'm just going to say a small phrase or two. I, I remember going into a department store in the, in the 80s. This sounds like a small phrase. <laughs> <laughs> in the 80s. Well, that's, that's it. And seeing Dolce Gabbana in there. Um, <laughs> It would always be 90% off at the end of the season in those early 80s. <clears throat> uh, and no one would buy it. It was very, very unfashionable. And I'd always see it because it'd always be everywhere. You know, it'd be absolutely everywhere. And it just never sold. No one would ever buy it. And I think what they have done is over that 20 or 30 years, worked very hard, however they've done it, to get to a certain position to build a very big business. And all the brands we review today are, are big businesses. And that's what's driving the design, essentially. So, you know, it, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> next, next. Who else do we want to talk about? <laughs> Let's talk, can we look at Damn Versace? Oh. Versace. Yeah. Of course we can look at Versace. I'd also like to talk slightly, do a little jump back to kind of Florence era because Gosha did his show when it was pity, so we're jamming him into yeah. Italy, yeah. which is weird. Uh, from <laughs> Russia too. Yeah. From Russia. Yeah. This from Versace Russia. looks like Prada again. The thing with this Versace was, and actually it's interesting to go back to it having seen everything else that happened, because I think it was the first time this season that we s saw seriously a long coat like that, which I always call the wrong thing. Is it a top coat or a city coat or a Car thingy coat? coat, whatever coat, the one on the left. Tell me what um, I should call it. You can just call it a long coat, well, <laughs> long top, long <laughs> tailored, tailored coat. Yeah, if it's above the knee, it's, it's a coat. And if it's below the knee, touching the ankle, it's a long coat. But long basically, the, 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 from this point on, and at the time, it seemed like, oh, what are they doing? Because they were the first ones to do it. Whereas actually, as the season went on, it's like, oh, we did see that at Versace. And also, they were also one of the few luxury brands to really engage in tailoring. Mm. Whereas many luxury brands moved away from it, and then which is when really we weird because everyone cool and young is doing tailoring exactly, now, which yeah. is the subversion which we we'll talk about with Gosh when we get to yeah. it. But they were one of the few to actually present tailoring on the catwalk. I mean, it wasn't. I mean, I actually think some looks had a tie, but it wasn't a businessman tie. It was a, a but. It, which they, is very ironic given Men Without Ties, which yeah. I know is a book that you like. <laughs> and we talked about that, it on the London panel this morning. But the, but the but that that double breasted <laughs> coat, no, the one on the left. Mm actually then returned in many, many forms throughout the rest of the men's wear season and is now appearing in women's wear. Mm -hmm. So I think Victoria Beckham had that card and was in the row. I mean, like, the, yeah. it's, 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 that, that's it's shaped now standard. a double breast. I do think men's, men's, Charlie's so right, and I, we should have made more of this point, though, because we're about to embark on our whole season of women's wear panels. And dear God, you are right, the amount of men's, not, not like a men's wear influence on the women's in a kind of like typical kind of you know, suit, suit yeah, thing, yeah. but in a like specific design details that you're seeing in the women's is quite extraordinary. But the nice, it's actually a nice thing because the thing is, is when, it, when we got to the end of Paris, there was a couple of shows where women's wear were invited as well. And you know, it's that last day of the shows and we're all haggard and knackered and the women's <laughs> were know, the coming fresh and like, and, 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 but so many of them said, oh, it's been a really interesting season. And it's like, oh, you were looking? Yeah. Whereas years before they would have been like, oh, what have you been doing? They no, would I've have known that men's wear was on. Whereas yeah. it seems to me now that the, the, the fashion, it's a really nice thing that actually what's known as fashion, which is actually women's mm. wear, is actually paying more attention to women's wear. Definitely. I think it was perfect. When I started working in the industry, which is not that long ago, it's perfectly normal to say that I just write about women's wear. And now when people say that, I think you sound, you sound quite foolish yeah. if you say that. I'm like, well... You can't ignore it. Yeah, like, you can't yeah. ignore it. It's, hu it's huge. But um, let's keep talking about Versace. Yeah, I, 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 it, it just is really interesting that, that, that I, I hope that people remember that they, they, they did that. Because I think at the time it was slightly overlooked, whereas actually they were very much in tune with ideas that carried on, like the double-rested suit, which then carried on through the whole season. Mm. So it's... Um, Versace is quite sexist, sexless for Versace in that very proud way, I guess. For this season, I think for the last couple of seasons, the, men, the women's wear as well kind of became a bit cooler in that way mm. where it's not like 
showing boobs and legs. But I think and this is traditional Versace sexy for me. I think. Well, I mean, look, the left look. I mean, I. I mean, the I hair know. kind of changes it. In yeah. some ways. <laughs> but I don't know. I feel the suit isn't that kind. I feel the suit is slightly sub more subversive than the usual Versace is. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong, but it's I mean, the styling just, that's subversive. Yeah, yeah. Dino and the hair. Well, yeah. The suit is very. That's very. Standard that's a standard thing. Versace suit. Well, it's a very standard mm -hmm. suit. Full stop. I mean, the positions of the buttons. The width of the lapel is wider, so they're making some kind of comment about. But I would always think of a Versace shoe yeah. with a lot of wider lapel. I don't know. What do you? What's your take on it? I think. I think. I think. I think, <laughs> I think. I think. I think they're going for. Um, uh, I think they're going for pushing the brand so that the brand is selling more things in more product categories. So it is um, more. Um, An interesting time for the brand yeah. as well. Mm. I mean, that's quite a statement in itself, <laughs> Charlie, isn't it? What you just said. Can you say again? What the, the, the brands want for, to be, in, yeah, they, they just want, want to, to sell more products in more categories. Yeah. Again, you know, wh where's the artistic, creative design role in that? Yeah. I suppose the challenge is to do something that's interesting based on what the business needs. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. It's not. It's yeah, not no, that. It's like, like, I have a feeling that it's like it's got like a jumper. It's like the, if you go up, can we go just up a little bit? The yeah, yeah, like the left look, that could easily have been in like a, the Balenciaga show. Yeah, I know. You know what, what I mean? mean? It, there is kind of that feeling, a bit more of cool, a bit less of like super, like Versace for me, whenever I looked at it, I'm not talking about well, the 90s like one. It was always just like, Beach yeah, Boy. exactly, yeah. like super, like the guy that knows how he looks and he goes, you know, with a purpose. And I feel like now, because you've got that guy on the right, but then you've got mm. another guy on the left, which obviously opens it up, mm. as you said, like an, a range of products rather mm. than just one type. It's interesting all the shows up until now that we've looked at, the ones that we've seen, that the um, influence of sportswear has just become so subliminal, or it's just we accept that it's there. It's not very obvious this season. Well, I, I mean, it is in that in the, it just is, it's, it's all pervasive. Right. It's all pervasive. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that four or five years ago, I would have written a whole article saying, oh my God, sportswear, tailoring, whatever. Now it's Whereas now it's just the normal. Yeah, it's now language. normal to say yeah. a suit was a suit was styled with trainers. Like yeah. it's, it's now. It's now, I think, why exactly, as you were saying before, Charlie, why if you look at like your Martin Roses and your Goshers and your Balenciagas, they're, li they're exploring workwear because yeah. that feels more provocative mm. and interesting. Like, mm. You know the fact that it, there is this huge irony to the fact that the tie has become like one of the most provocative styling tricks. Can we, can we go to um, Ozenia um, and the Guild Ozenia Couture? Because <laughs> 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 um, this is actually this is a real case in point. So this was Alessandro <laughs> Sartori's first, first collection, debut, yeah. and this and this was a real case of um, ca the casualization of tailoring yeah. from and grown up sports but. from from a brand which has one of the biggest tailoring businesses and tailoring manufacturing businesses in the world, right? I yes. mean, the, so, because then you also make, then you make their own suits and sell a lot of them and they also mm. make- and their own fabric. Everyone else's They suits. make a lot of suits for yeah. many other brands. Mm -hmm. um, and then in this, in this show, every, there wasn't a single tie in the whole show. Mm. Um, and most of the looks were styled with a sneaker or the baseball cap or a mm. gathered hat trousers or. at the bottom. But I loved when um, Stefano Pilati kind of brought the fluidity. I thought that kind of nodded in the right direction of that. Like th it was a sh it was a weird fit that because you just those clothes just felt like they had no life off the yeah. runway. But the kind of femininity that he would bring to that, I felt carried through into this quite nicely. Did you not? Yeah, I thought it was. A, I think it was a appropriate and respectful. Exactly. But it was very, it was a very different collection. Yeah, totally. Alessandro, I mean, the Alessandro and Stefano are very different designs. But this would have felt bizarre without the work that Stefano yeah, had put definitely. in place, which I, I mean, think is nice. The between kind yeah. of yeah. period. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but the, the, the massive difference is that Stefano was was um, was hired just to do this collection, which is the which if they go into the store, <clears> the price tag is like insanely insane. Yeah. Mm. He was hired just to do that, and there was never any trickle down into no. Zenia, yeah. anything. And actually, if you went into the store, it'd be so isolated in the top room, it'd be like a couple of pieces. And so it never fitted, and, and it was, it, that became a problem. The thing with Alessandro is that he's creative director or artistic director of the entire company. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so they realise that actually they need to have someone looking down over everything and bringing, modernising every single cut everywhere. And the thing is, is that Alessandro's worked, because Zenia is still a family run business and he worked there 10 years ago, so he knows them really well. So that's why this one feels a little bit more smooth, smooth because, yeah. because he has the kind of whole 
Um, or just the knowledge vision. of it all. Yeah. I mean, th this show wasn't in any way perfect for me at all, but there were many things about it that, that, were, that were nice. Uh, yeah, but also, it's another one where it actually looks really great in pictures as well. Yeah, really, I, think I think it's it's sometimes there's a, if, you, if you can't, you, you might not, but like that guy there on the left with the suit with the white. Actually, both sides, if you look, that's a tab fastening the jacket. Yeah. It's not buttoned across. Mm. And it's there so that in case you want your jacket to be a little bit wider, I don't think any man's ever said, I want to hold my jacket a little bit oh, wider. Oh, like it's a tab that connects it. It's a tab that connects it across. So, so there's, 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 well. there's some design details which is like, you don't need to do them. Like, can't yeah. that, like you know, can't, it, it, it's enough change. for it to be nice. Were you so, there, Charlie? Yeah. yeah. What was on the floor? So this was also a problem for me because this the space is it, was... Is it just all Carl Andre? No, the space is called, bo like bo it. what's it called, the, the, um, uh, the hangar back, I can't remember, it's an art space on the outskirts of Milan. Oh, um, where they have the Anselm Kiefer. Exactly, and this is an Anselm Kiefer space, so this oh. is among Anselm Kiefer. Oh yeah, you can Anselm see them in the back. Yeah. It's, it's called like, the, it's like I'm not going to translate. It's yeah. like the six pillars. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's the most extraordinary work, which I have only now seen twice with fashion shows around it and, it and the first one so was much. a d-squared one, one. Nice one. one. Now, I, <laughs> I love Anselm Kiefer and imagine I, I wrote I wrote in the FT at the end of my review I wrote does Anselm Kiefer know this is happening <laughs> and, and and the brand messaged me afterwards and were, and were like yeah yeah he does he approved it so I think more to Anselm Kiefer what are you doing letting people <laughs> letting people hold fashion shows among your work which is meant to be a great spirituality and whatever but can we go back to that the Xenia um yeah so basically, but but even but then so they didn't just do the show in the space. They then, for some reason, put these kind of chevrons of metal, um, like there were kind of folds of metal to mark out the catwalk. Yeah, but kind of did, but didn't. And they went all the way into the end of but the. You know so that, you, but you know what people, that is. People That's fell over them. People yeah. kept tripping, knocking them out of shape. <laughs> it's like <laughs> what they do. But also, it's like <laughs> you're in an Anselm Kiefer installation. Don't. Out and some Kiefer and some Kiefer. Yeah, but that, that's that's my not criticism. So I don't like to, to criticise anyone, creative or designers. But that's the, the the issue with fashion design interpretation or amalgamating artistic references into show spaces or work. That is very putting things on the floor like that in very geometric patterns, very industrial in a space which already has an artist. And this is for me, it's Carl Andre. It's straight away the reference is Carl Andre. I know Alessandro a little bit, and I know he likes art. But you have to create a catwalk, you know, you have to do something in order for them, for them to walk down. And he probably you felt... You put tape on the floor when you've got that behind you. Like well, okay, that would have maybe been the thing to do because it's yeah. honest and it has a tradition harking back to the gallery, you use tape. Yeah. But they probably thought, well, we want something, you know, should it be carpet? What can it be? Well, let's yeah. just do something sculptural. The, the, the thing to do would have been to have held it in a small venue where you weren't among that sort of keeper. I mean, that was that. To, to me, to me it, it, okay. it, it doesn't... But it the doesn't clothes need. are nice. So an important thing about this to, to, to compare to Goshel, which we will talk about yeah. next, is that this is this is a, <laughs> the most kind of like a tailoring brand that's not really showing tailoring or is in a, in, in a, in a way that involves casualization. And also the thing about the pleat pan, which then went through everywhere. Um, through the whole season, so it was also very. I just much wrote a thing about pleats there. for the FT this weekend. You did, but not Fine. pleat pants though. It was pleat. No, it was pleats. It was like pleats. Yeah, women's pleats. It was actually pleat pleat funny. Pants. I was speaking to the guys at Mr. Porter. I was like, I'm doing a thing on pleated trousers, and they were like, We have lots of single pleat trousers. And I was like, Not quite what I'm doing. <laughs> you could have done a sister story to that. Yeah. Just about to next season, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Let's talk about Gosha. Let's talk about Gosha, which took place, uh, just for the sake of obvious, so they don't think we've gone totally bonkers. So Pizzi, which was the Florentine trade show, which is before Milan, um, during Pizzi, Gosha, in a slight two fingers up to Pizzi, given that they paid for his show last Lovely. season, <laughs> staged his show, slap bang in the middle, taking fabulous journalists like Charlie over, away from Pizzi, over to Cullen. Well, I wouldn't have gone to Pizzi this season anyway. Oh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not accusing you of, of defecting. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, there, there, wasn't, there wasn't anything uh, to completely make me go to pity this season. So th that was, it wasn't a case of they took me away from it. I, I yeah, wouldn't have gone. you wouldn't have gone. Um, the thing is, so basically, actually, it's really weird them showing you on the bottom of the screen. Can the, you see yourself? Yeah, okay. <laughs> the, 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 so basically, the soundtrack, there was no music. It was literally each of the models, um, Gosho recorded them talking in Russian, saying their name, their age, and what it was that they... What their, what, their, what their likes were, their aspirations in life were. 
and gosh, God, really who's got my life? I was a swimmer for seven years, and I also like rock climbing. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe he was inspired by you. But, <laughs> but, 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 but the thing is, got the thing is, gosh, with the show, gosh, really wanted to make it into some sort of a, a reality and a real idea of the man that he is evolving with his brand. It was, I don't know if it's the first time, but he didn't work with his, a stylist this time. He's previously worked with Lotta. Um, Lotta Bukova. Um, but he just worked on his own. And the, the point seemed to be that these were young men who would wear his clothes, wearing his clothes. And, and, and then also evolving the wardrobe into ideas of tailoring. I have a question for you. Uh -huh. You wear a lot of gosha yeah. and you are a young man in many ways, I'm but not, not I'm 43. as you're 43. How do you feel as an older man wearing gosha and what is the impetus to wear it when in some ways it seems so much about ideas of youth? I'm interested in that. Is it like a, is it a kind mean, of like living clothes, vicarious so thing? No, because I like the clothes and I like track pants, so I wear them. I mean, I don't, I hopefully I don't wear it to look like a teenager. No, I don't. I, I wear it. I wear it because I find it interesting in terms of design, and, and um, I also. I mean, uh, um, yeah. I, don't know. I just. I always. I always find that interesting when a brand is like. Like I always kind of wondered it about older men who wore Saint Laurent. I guess it's a similar thing because you also. Well, like that, I mean, that's, that's different because the thing. I mean, what Eddie did was very cleverly recognise that there were garments that men would remember or recognise from their youth and want to still wear with the change in the way men wear clothing. And that they'd have the money to buy them. And have, when they yeah. have the money to buy them, yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the things Eddie did very cleverly. Mm. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, maybe there is some d about delayed adolescence, maybe there is something about, but I, I just like wearing his clothes. Mm. Um, I just think there is an interesting thing on that, like we've done, like I'm really interested in fashion's relationship with youth. Like we did a girly series on Show Studio, and I did that mad about the boy exhibition. I think there's something really interesting that when it gets beyond an aesthetic thing to it, something that is driving people purchasing certain clothes, and what is it? Is it is it in any way to do with that like that spirit that no, invites someone in? I don't think it always is, but I think for I certain. Think for, I mean, there's like a. I think there's a difference between you who who. No, you know, you read, you write about Gosha, you have that experience of Gosha. So that's part of why you buy. I mean, yes, it's the design, but you have, I mean, the dinner isn't that, like, it's not like something that's hyper designed. Mm -hmm. So I would say that it's also maybe the story behind it because, you know, you're mm. interested in it. Of course it is. Because if you, if you just like track pants, you'd buy an Yeah, exactly. Pair. Nike pair. Well, that's actually not true. The thing with Gosha's track pants is they're actually really interestingly cut. Like, mm. I've got a Gosha mm. track pant compared to a juicy track pant or compared to a. I'd love to see the juicy track pant. <laughs> well, I really wouldn't. But like, or even like a sports wear track pant. I mean, he yeah. cuts them very differently. He actually take, cuts them as a tailoring thing. There are some, yeah. the shows where he has them mm. done high, that's yeah. because they're cut to be done more yeah. than that. Like, way, yeah. There is there is design yeah. in them, and, and also the thing is is that Gosh has been doing this a long time, and I've I've been buying Gosh's clothes before I knew Gosh's. I, I, yeah. I, I, no, I, but I mean, so it's just, I think there's like what you said. These are the, the guys that he showed are the guys that would wear his clothes. Yeah. I completely disagree. The, the, those guys would wear those clothes, but not Gosh's clothes. Those guys would would go to like a, you know. To a second-hand shop in the North Caucasus. But then and I, buy I, those I actually used to think like that. But then last, when he showed up, Pitsy, he did a casting call for the show, just like on his Instagram to kids that wanted to walk in, to walk from in Florence it. or in no, Florence. No, yeah. for the for the show in Florence, he did but a casting call. But the guys call. were the casting just from call anywhere, was just from anywhere. He okay. just put it out on his Instagram, and I was speaking to one of the girls from Com de Garcon and Com for the sake of yeah, yeah. like, you know, uh, finance Gosher in some ways and, and help him produce his clothes. And her, they got something like a thousand emails in the space of sort of five minutes. Her email oh, right. Of course, of course. No, but, but, but they don't. But, they but, but, they no, but but they worship they him worship and they love him. his yeah. and they there save up. And, but it's like, crazy. And, and, the, and the models that are in that show. They they were literally they, they after the show they would go up to him going, "Can I have your photo? Can I have your photo?" Yeah. And he was like, "Why? I've been with you for three days. Why? I mean, why are you asking me now?" It's like we were too scared before. Like they had to wait till after. Yeah, but that's true. There they want to wear it. There is a sick. There is a sixteen-year-old family. I do agree with you. They dress like that anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's my whole point. Is I think why they why they want to wear it because they they see themselves in it. They don't, you know. It's not. I don't know. It's not I a feel, new proposition. I have a prob to yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have a slight problem with it because it is kind of the whole. Um, I don't know, like like you know, putting a label. It's that. Do you see it thing. as exotic? Yeah, exactly. The same thing, you know. I feel with sometimes about Vetement 
and the similar thing that I feel about Gosha, even though it does feel more genuine, more kind of actually, you know, real. Um, I have a problem with it being like, I see these guys around where I'm from, mm. and then I take what they're doing, you know, elevate it a little bit, and then put a, like a giant price tag on it. I mean, the thing is, but that's what's happening, Dino. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely. Because I acknowledge that, that that's happening, but no, I don't like. No, it. but it's good. It's good because this happens every 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. As I was watching it, and um, how many seasons has he done, Charlie? He's actually done a lot. He's he started in He was a fashionist. Okay. Yeah. 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 As I was watching it, it's kind I of. I think he's been in the spotlight for maybe, like, as in a significant three, spotlight for maybe three years. Yeah. You can understand that he's real. He's obviously very modest as well, and the way that you know he styles. The collection is very modest too. And he obviously has technique, you know, which you've spoken about. He understands how to cut something. So everything he's doing is very real and it's very modest. He's a little bit further away from your generation, Dino, but your generation understands that you can do this, maybe have one piece or just buy it all yourself and style it yourself. And you're feeling now, ironically, how I sometimes feel when I see other people's collections and I think, well, we were doing that 20, you know, that's how we were dressing 20, 25 years ago. We would take these various elements and do it ourselves. Saint Laurent, Haiti got a lot of stick. We did a panel yeah. one time yeah. where I was very for what he was doing, but a lot of people were saying, no, he's just copying vintage clothing. But there is, there, is a, there is a skill if you do that retrospectively, but there also is a skill in taking the spirit of the times. Mm. And this is the spirit of the times at this moment. To people that are this side of Europe, looking at this sort of stark, shall we call it a stark minimal sensibility mm. that he's presenting, this is very kind of now, this sort of speaks of, it's uplifting, but if you look at it and look at the expressions of the models and the way the captions come up in the text, it's actually a little bit depressing, nonchalantly depressing. It's which nonchalant is, is the best word for oh, it. Yeah, yeah. well, if, if you're in fashion, but if you're not in fashion and you're looking at it, there is a depressive feel to the way that the world just has become. But he represents that perfectly. I mean, I think it's super smart. I think I, it's that issue of ownership, though, yeah, which is constantly an issue in fashion of like, you know, designers get so called out for copying other designers. Well, they don't so much anymore, but they used to. And it used to be such an insult to say this <coughs> looks like that. Whereas now it's almost a compliment. And this and this idea of taking something that you live through or a, a culture and selling it back to people has become it. sort of normal. Yeah. It's well, the designer think, as curator. I think the, 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 the point about this is, is actually talking to what you were saying before about fantasy, is that what a lot of fashion does that isn't luxury is is a, is a, as a mirror, it's a mirror of reality. So what Vetman do, Vetman do is a mirror of reality. What they're doing is representing what they see. What did you and think about what, their stereotype show? I thought it was amazing, but I wasn't there, so I can't talk about it. I only talk about things I saw. Okay. So, um, but, um, <laughs> but, 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 no, but the thing is, the thing, the thing about Vetmore and, and, and Gosh as well is that they're, they're looking at reality. So uh, there was also this show in Hollywood in New York that, that based its styling on homelessness. And Guy Trevay wrote a really good piece in the New York Times about how it was about a mirror to reality. And because and, there were some people saying how dare you, it's disgusting to do that. And I do like, think it was quite disgusting. I, I didn't, because, because, Did because, it, because, because why should fashion always be representing the nice fantasy? Oh, definitely. Because you're that. selling yeah. no, 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 but anyway, but no, let's, let's go back to this. But the thing about this is that like, it, it, the, the reflection of reality is, is, is what is so interesting about Gosh. But can, sense I just, of can we just jump in then? Sure. I'm sorry to that. Well, that like, I know we haven't touched that theme in this <laughs> panel, but I have to be talking about reality then. This is a collaboration with Adidas, right? Some in, of it, in, yeah. Some and of it, it was like in honor pieces. of the world. Yeah, but it was kind of like with the whole story of the World Cup and it was like a football theme and yeah. all that. So if you're like channeling the, the idea of reality, like, isn't that like this a very limiting idea of reality where all the guys are like no one is older than 22 and doesn't ha and is not white and has a bus cut like isn't that where where does that you know like it's it's fine to take reality but then you have to take the responsibility that reality takes with it mm -hmm. so you can't be oh i'm, I'm re representing reality but then when it comes to like actual reality which is race age um size whatever it is then you, you don't kind of you know, I mean, I get, I completely understand what you're saying, but then I have this kind of whole idea of like, but you can't just pick and choose and then forget about everything else. But I don't think that Gosh... Fashion was, does that, Dino. And also, Gosh, Gosh was never said that, I, I didn't, Gosh was representing a very specific idea of, I mean, the age it's thing, his it's, it's a youth thing, mm -hmm. and this is about <clears throat> a, a youth street culture in Russia. I. And it's, it's so difficult to talk about race 
when it's a brand that I admire and they haven't got a black model in it. But I don't think that that is necessarily a thing to suddenly start running this show for. I, I kind of do. I've kind of got to a point, I think, with shows where if they don't have a black model in it, well, it's not even if they don't have a black model, actually, it's kind of it's fucking annoying when there's like one black model. I just, I just think how... They look the same. That's uh, yeah, the thing. I, I, just, exactly I just think the there's the no with. real reason anymore to do a show yeah. that only features white people. Yeah. There's I, a I responsibility just, if you've got a voice, I think, that, that's, that's exactly what I think. Yeah, I, I mean, just think if you have a platform, any platform, he has a huge platform. Yeah. You have a responsibility yeah. if you have a voice. But I, the purity of the message say, is strong. I mean, there's nothing I can say. I do, I do, I mean, I do think it's a really say. sensitive issue. It's not no, completely. I'm not being, you know, like black no. and white about it. For <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> but I mean, it's. it's I like think also my slight issue with the homelessness thing. I think it's really interesting what you're saying, Charlie. And I'm conscious that we're very slightly off topic. Like I had less of a problem when John Galliano. Obviously, I wasn't. I didn't see the show when John Galliano did the homeless collection. Obviously, it was like a Dior. So it was a huge brand in some ways. But I felt like with John Galliano. However Dior labelled itself, removing John Galliano from Dior, he was someone who was very much about... <laughs> I'd love to become what Balenciaga is. No, but about like, express, <laughs> expressing himself and, and, you know, so unfortunate what happened, sort of, well, not unfortunate, like, awful, all sort of what, how he behaved in the end. But if you looked at most of his collections, they were about championing people who maybe didn't get championed in fashion. And he, there was a rawness and an authenticity to what he did. And I never thought his work was cynical. And it was just about the joy of creating. Vetmore as a label, as they have admitted, Vetmore is about clothes. It's about selling and making clothes. I think they have a different license to mime, like, mine homelessness as an inspiration to I someone who is... I think they did, when did Vetmore do homelessness? In the last show. In, in, in the stereotypes, one of the looks was a homeless man. Like a guy I mean, I, w I was talking about In Hollywood, which was a whole show. Yeah, no, no, I know. I was just, I was I mean, just saying. I, I didn't see that much. You didn't so see that much, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I know, no, I think it is. I didn't, I didn't know there was one, but like, but, but I also think, and because at Vetmon is more than just selling garments. I mean, Demna said after the Manciaga show, Vetmon is about reality, all his work is about a reality. I, 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 I think, of, I mean, I would much rather see a show that was a mirror of reality than some luxury fantasy that's, that's for someone to, I But I just, I just think whose reality? I think that's... The reality that we all see. But then, day. like, that's not a museum show. But I don't show. see this it's reality every day. It's a fashion show day. that wants to sell clothes. Why yeah. does it, why does it kind of, what, what does it have the right to tell my story or somebody else's story and then sell that story? Yeah. You know, that's my problem with it. It's like, why, why, why does fashion take the right, like, why does that fashion designer take the right to look at something, take it completely, mm. and then set, put his label on it, it's own it, and sell it? Luxury. No, I think it's just, mm. I don't know. It's back to that same point again. I, I think, think what worries does. me slightly is the number of designers who are doing fashion, as you put it, do white fashion. You know? I, com I mean, I, com I, mean this <laughs> I completely disagree. I think there was so much more. Um, uh, I hate the word diversity because I think it's. Yeah, it, I know what you but, mean. But, but, but I think it. I, think I just, I don't know, it just worries me slightly. I know it's an issue that is very dear to me and I talk about it a lot, so I probably sound like a bit of a broken record, but like, I thought the junior show was kind of foul, like to do something like that with on all white models, just to have like brain dead in terms of like understanding of the platform you have and how society is shaped. And like, it's, I love Johnny Watanabe, I think he's an incredible designer, but like, n like, you know, I, I don't know, I just, and I kind of think it was with some of these shows, like Gosha is such a sympathetic, amazing, interesting person. I don't get why he does this. It bothers me because I think he's amazing and I hugely respect him. I just think there's that weird thing when it, it is a shame when something that is being sort of discussed as like the avant-garde and the new, actually yeah. looks less progressive than the Prada show, the Prada show or the Fendi show. You, you mean show. less progressive in ideas or visually? Less pro no, more progressive in terms of ideas, less progressive in terms of the people who are featured. Mm. Because, you know? the, I mean, it's an interesting word, the interesting words you use there for me, Lua, the avant-garde. I mean, uh, Charlie, who, who are the, are there political designers now? Can they be such I mean, a thing? Don't, we, weren't, we weren't talking about London, but if we were here yeah. a few hours ago, then um, every, everyone is shown in London, but we're not talking about London. Okay, mm. I know. London mm -hmm. is very particular. I mean, this is interesting. London is very, very particular because um, as a country and as a society, we've always been very kind and liberal and accepting. Mm. You know, I can't think of another place in the world that's been like England for the last, or London mm. particularly, last 20, 30 years. Can you? Which I do think is slightly a danger, not a danger, but I feel bad slightly for someone like Gosha where it, 
the reality he grew up in is very different to the reality I, I'm not from London. No, but also but, Gosha, yeah. Gosha would actually say to you, he'd feel bad for you growing up in your reality. <laughs> God, the thing with yeah, Gosha is yeah. that he actually loves, he loves Russia and he loves... Of course. I mean, no, that's God, I, I don't mean I feel bad for him because he grew up in Russia. I mean, I feel bad that people who grew up in a melting pot such as London mm. are like, oh, presume I mean, he's sort of somehow racist because he doesn't... Like, if I did a Look, collection, it would reflect my reality, which is growing up... Like, I grew up in Luton, well, like, between Bedford and Luton, which is majority Asian population, like somewhere like Bedford and Luton. So my reality is very different to someone who grows up in an area which is still majority white people, which is kind of quite similar to, I think, I moved to London two and a half years ago, and until then, I was 21, 21 years. The, all of my life, I was, like, living in Croatia and Zagreb, which is, like, I don't know the exact percentage, but 99% white. Yeah. Um, maybe ninety five, but um, and I don't, I don't think if I, if I, you know, write about stuff, if I go and style, I don't know, for example, a shoot, and then I get to cast people, I'm going to look at, you know, different. Th I'm not just going to be like, oh, I want to tell my story, whatever mm. my story is. That's just not. I don't think how life should work because I think we do have a big responsibility, we, and our responsibility, the responsibility is way bigger than just telling a story. You know, because you're not just writing it for yourself mm. and you're for your friends you're writing it for all these people and just because we're talking about it now that just puts the responsibility on him and on all these people mm. to kind of act and behave in a more acceptable manner. I think it also comes back though to us and responsibility to us if, and, and everyone in general of like whose story is allowed to be told and there's a reason why these stories are out there and seem as mm. cool and exciting and there's and a reason why other people's not. stories don't get told in the same yeah. way you know I think that's I always think about it slightly with Hid by Air, and I think Hid by Air is amazing, and the lack of, the feverish hype around Gosha and Vetmon that has never quite existed around, around Shane and Hid by Air. Gypsy Sport. And, Gypsy yeah. Sport. I, don't, I don't think Gosha's had an article in, in, in the New Yorker. Yeah, but I, I mean, Hid by Air is, Hid by Air is pretty, pretty well. I mean, it's, they're very different garments. I mean, like, mm. the, the point about Gosha is that it works because those garments are cheap, relatively cheap. Like the t-shirts are 100 quid, mm. like the, nothing is really above 200 quid. So the, one of the reasons that Gosha has worked is that as, a, as garments, they're incredibly approachable for a young customer to buy into. And there's a, there's a simplicity about them. That's garments. kind of the same with the Hidbaya branded t-shirt. Mm, no, because a Hidbaya branded t-shirt is a half-half t-shirt with a thing. God, no, there's fuckloads of just normal little t-shirts. No, t -shirts. But, but, but the, the main Hidbaya message isn't I mean, it isn't. I'm sure. I mean, like, yeah. we're not going to rail in front of us, but like, a Gosha T-shirt is a Gosha T-shirt. Yeah, he, I know what very, you mean. He yeah. very rarely goes into into an idea. Which is, you're not going to get yeah. eight sleeves or right. anything. Yeah. No, I mean, there was a good if you can continue to keep the price down. Because but that's that but that's, the, that's, that's the business. That's the, the business yeah, is that it's the it's plan. the business is that it's always affordable. Accessible. It's accessible, and affordable, and also the thing is, is that they cap the number of stores that can buy it now. Um, there are so many people who want to sell it, and they don't let any more people buy it. And also, stores can only buy a certain amount. So it keeps a sense of exclusivity, but it's affordable. It's good. Does and he the have sustainability also, too? Well, because he's got Com supporting him. So. Is it sustainable too? Is he ethical about what he makes as well? I have no it. idea about that. But okay. Well, no. So how many boxes do you have to tick now as a brand? You know, yeah. it's um, incredible. I think most brands don't. And aren't. Yeah. But but the, the, but the thing is, is that like above and beyond beyond any of this stuff, I really want to wear loads of these clothes. Mm. So. Um, <laughs> and I, but I say that really proudly. Give it, give it bias. I say that bias really proudly as well. Like, yeah. I, 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 there's so, no, there's so many yeah. things that I can say about everything you've said, and I, I'm not going to say them because mm. I can't even work out how to say them. But, no, no, no. I mean, but, 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 of course, but, it's but, important but, to be proud. I also about, think like, we, as a panel of four white people, it's kind of like. Oh, of yeah. course. I mean, it's so like, but I mean, I just, don't, I don't want to seem like it's like I'm talking like a bad about like what you because you think that you want you want to wear that that's not something negative it's just that I don't I see it in a pro different way and I and I don't want to wear I it. I do think so it's amazing it. clothing and I think I love I find it really charming and actually invigorating seeing the passion of those kids who want to buy it because how mm. fucking rare is it to be at a show where like yeah just like where there are kids like screaming and so excited. I think that's amazing. Don't you go back the show. Oh yes. <laughs> anyway, I'm really, I'm really conscious of time and also I'm so hot. I feel like I'm going to pass out. So is there anyone else that we want to talk about? Is there anything else? Or how would we sum up Milan then? Actually, I kind of disagree with what you said at the beginning because I actually thought with Marnie and we didn't talk about Ferragamo and we don't need to, but there were a couple of new designers in a couple of places that actually were showing stuff that was 
a bit more interesting. So it's, it, I mean, the thing is, Milan has been a vacuum for a long time. It's mm. not just this season, it's been empty for a long while. Mm. Um, but there was a sense that things were slightly stabilizing it in a very low, <laughs> in a very low <laughs> sense. Yeah. But, yeah. What's your take, Carlo? Anything to, any closing nuggets? No, I think Milan's, although Charlie used the word void, I understand what you mean in the, in the context you mean. I think Milan is Milan, it's, it's business. There is a conservatism to Italian designers. They like to maintain what they have. And I think in these, in these times that we're living through now, to just keep the business that you have up until now is an achievement as opposed to stretching and trying to find something different. So, so should we give them a round of applause for giving us so much to talk about? Thank <laughs> you.